How's everybody doing tonight? All right. All right. I'm doing great as well. I had the best day yesterday. I went, I went, I went with my family to the happiest place on earth yesterday. I did. I did. And I had a great time. The best thing was, is I wasn't checking my phone all day to see who was winning. <laughs> I just trusted in the Lord and amen. amen. <laughs> all right. Well, Pastor Burt's in North Carolina um, with Firefighters for Christ. And, uh, you know, he said they went in this town. They're in a town called Burnsville. And he said the devastation is just horrific there. It's in a, it's kind of in a mountain top area, and he showed some pictures of just taking out full bridges, big, huge bridges, and all kinds of stuff. But we're going to show just a few, uh, a few pictures, not a whole lot, and a couple of short videos, and then we're going to pray for him. No, that was that was from before. There's some pictures in a minute that are current. Mm -hmm. Ready? Okay. I'm I'm Joe Lindemann, and this is Tom Nichols, and we're with uh, Firefighters for Christ, and we're out here working with your pastor, Bert, and we're out here cleaning up a house. It, it got hit by the. Uh, hurricane that came through North Carolina. You can see the house in the background behind us. We've been uh, digging out tools and we've been cleaning the place up, trying to help the people out here and share the love of Christ. Uh, we are so uh, happy to have your pastor Bert with us and we love it when you share him with Firefighters for Christ. And uh, we just hope that this continues on uh, throughout the, the, the years. We know that Pastor Bert is, is gonna be taking some more trips with us here in the, in the future. And we're just glad to have him part of us. And we're glad to have your church body as part of our organization. We know you guys pray a lot for us, and we really need that foundation of your prayers. And we're so grateful that we have uh, have this relationship with you guys. Someday, once again, probably soon, we'll be down there and, and just informing you of all the things that we've been doing throughout the years. And uh, and your support, like I said, is just so... It, we can't even express how much it means to us. Thank you. Tom, you want to say something? Yeah. We had a good productive day and the people were very thankful for all that we did. They said that just by the work that Samaritan's Purse did, it saved their house. So it's very rewarding and, and uh, it's great to be here. Uh, my name's Jeff, and I'm just uh, God's hands and feet up here working into this, uh, talking to Pastor Burke to y'all's church in California. It's real simple. Just love Jesus. And in this situation, love your neighbor more than you love yourself. And whatever God's give you, now's the time to be about giving back to God and just being about Him. So I'm praying for whatever denomination it is. Jesus wasn't a denomination. He was the man. And so that's what we need to be as God's people. We just need to work for the for the one true living God. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Amen, huh? You know what? I think he said his name was Jeff. <laughs> he said J-F. <laughs> but just love Jesus and love your neighbor more than you love yourself. And just a servant, you know. So let's go ahead and bow before the Lord and pray for them. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you and we thank you, Lord. We thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for this night, Father. For this is the day that you've made and we shall rejoice and be glad in it, Lord. And, and we trust you, Father. And we ask that you would be with Pastor Bert and the team there, Lord, as they're mucking out houses, as they're trying to get things in order so that the houses can get rebuilt. 
Lord, we ask that you would just uh, continue to use them to share the love of Christ with others, Lord, and and just the opportunities to sit and listen to some of the people and just pray for them and minister to them, Lord. So we ask that you'd be with them, Lord, and we ask that you would just guide them in Jesus' name, Lord. And we also do lift up tonight's study, Father. Lord, it's, uh, it's in your hands, Lord. We ask that you would minister to our hearts this evening, Lord. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah, Pastor Bert had mentioned to me that he talked to this one gentleman who lost his life, or his wife, and um, she lost her life. And I guess that the floods came up, the waters came in, and they were grabbing onto a tree, and a, a rock took her out. Yeah, he didn't go into the details. He said, I'll spare you the details now. I'll tell you later. But um, he, he was uh, talking with that gentleman and have, had an opportunity to pray with him and just minister to him. Well, now that the election's over, how's everybody feeling? Yeah, well, I guarantee you there's a sigh of relief for a lot of people, but there's a lot of people in our country that are anxious. And that's the reality, is it's on the forefront of everybody's minds. Um, the title of the message is Trust in the Lord. And, you know, a lot of people are wondering if everything's going to be okay. Whoever you voted for, whatever proposition, if it passed or didn't pass, the judges, what, what judges are going to be serving, what the elected sheriff, who he is or she, and the list goes on. And... This year we've gotten, I've gotten a ton of political mail. Seen way too many signs. The political commercials have been brutal. The rhetoric, both sides, have, has been just bad. And whether we like the results or not, I think everyone's had enough as far as that part goes. You know, and I've talked to some people, and in their families, there's such a great divide that family members won't even talk to other family members. And they, like, aren't just doing that for temporary. They said, don't talk to me anymore. And so the divide is huge. And, you know, there's a lot of people in our country that are anxious, about 50% that are anxious, not saying that others aren't, but... You know, the, it's a pretty divided country, uh, Christians as well as non-Christians, and the future of America, America as well as their personal future. So they're, they're thinking about um, themselves. And by the way, I, I put together this study before yesterday because I said, you know what, and I'm not going to change anything about it because, yep, we trust in the Lord. And... Um, I've heard a lot of people say that whoever, if they didn't vote for, if they voted for somebody and that person didn't win, then they're moving out of the country. I think per, Pastor Burt mentioned that on Sunday. Uh, I don't know. I hope a bunch of people from Hollywood pack their bags and go, <laughs> you know? Um, seriously, it's, uh, well, a lot of stuff's happened this year. And if you think about all these things, I'm just going to read a few things. Approximately 80 countries representing about 4 billion people have had or are in the process of having elections this year. AI, artificial intelligence, it's continuing to explode and remake our IT industry. Egypt, Ethiopia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and the, a, or the UAE, they all became BRICS members, and that's a group that was designed to bring together the world's most influential and important developing countries to change the political and the economic power of the wealthier nations of North America and Western Europe. So they want to compete. There's been devastating wildfires throughout our country, California, Texas, Colorado, Idaho, Montana, New Mexico, and other states. Devastating hurricanes, Beryl, Helene, which you just saw, Milton, and others. Several major floods throughout the world this year. And last week, I think we threw a couple pictures up of Valencia in um, Spain. 
So far this year, there's a continuation of major armed conflicts, including the continued Russian invasion of the Ukraine, Myanmar civil war, the Sudanese civil war, and the Islamist insurgency in Sahel. Ongoing Israel-Hamas war, yep, that's led to spillover into numerous countries, most notably Lebanon, following continued rocket barrage from Hezbollah. Iran launched almost 200 ballistic missiles toward Israel, which were mostly intercepted. And that was the second attack this year. The previous one, they launched 300 missiles, which were pretty much, or uh, 300 missiles and drones, and that was in April, and those were pretty much taken out. And in response, Israel conducted precision airstrikes against military targets in Iran. Many countries have increased their defense budget, dramatically increased it. So as a whole, there isn't much stability in our world right now. There's a lot going on around us. Major health issues, financial insecurity for many, estranged family members, and a lot of people have major life decisions that are coming up. Many people in the world are living in fear. Maybe even some of us are. Some of our friends or some of our loved ones. And, and as believers, where do we go? Where do we turn when we're anxious or fearful? We have good news, right? Yes. We do. We have the roadmap to life. And God in his word shares a message of comfort, reassurance, and promise to be with us, encouraging us to cast our cares and anxieties and fears upon him because he cares for us and wants to bring our worries to him so that he can provide that peace and rest that we need. Essentially, he reminds us that we're not alone and that we can trust in his presence and his strength. And a comforting promise in scripture is that God will never leave us or forsake us. And that's from Hebrews 13, five. It says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. When you're in fear or anxious, knowing that God will be with you, that's pretty calming and comforting. And Moses first shared these words of the Lord with Israel and Joshua before they entered the promised land in Deuteronomy 31, six. Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear or be afraid. Speaking of those coming against them, for the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Moses was reminding Joshua, as the succeeding leader, the Lord himself goes before him, and he'll be with him. He'll never leave him, and he'll never abandon him. Moses said, with that in mind, Joshua, don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. And God spoke to Jacob in Genesis 28, 13 to 15. I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I've spoken to you. So God reiterated to Jacob the covenant made with Abraham and Isaac, promising him the land as well as the descendants as numerous as the dust. God also promised to protect Jacob to be with him. Well, just as God promised Abraham, Joshua, Jacob, he promises all those that are his. 
that he will never leave us and he won't forsake us. It's comforting to know that he's right here with us, isn't it? He won't leave us. He won't forsake us. Well, I read the second half of Hebrews 13, 5. I will never leave you nor, nor forsake you. But the whole verse says, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such th things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So the promise of, I will never leave you nor forsake you, is preceded by a command. It says, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Yeah, who is right. Yeah. Instead of trusting in riches and material goods, which will ultimately fail us, we should place our hope in God. He promises not to leave nor forsake. Riches and other resources can depart in a moment, can't they? But the Lord is with his children forever. Our faith and our trust should be in him alone. What does the Bible say about trusting the Lord? Turn with me to Psalm 118, verse 8. It's almost the middle of the Bible. Psalm 118, verse 8. Well, this psalm, it's typically attributed to King David. And verse 8 reads, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. And the Hebrew word for trust here is hasa, which is a verb and it means to seek refuge, to flee for protection, to put trust in God, to confide in God, or to hope in God. So it's better to seek refuge in the Lord, to confide in him, to hope in God, to have our security in the Lord, than put confidence in man. Instead of seeking refuge in the Lord, Plenty of people put their confidence in man, right? Or woman. And today, after the election, rest assured there are many that are happy about the results of the election, as well as many that are fearful and unhappy. Psalm 118, it's between the shortest chapter in the Bible, Psalm 117, two verses, and the longest chapter in the Bible, Psalm 119, 176 verses. And uh, Pastor Burt brought this verse out on Sunday, and uh, he also shared that many people attributed this uh, Psalm 118, 8 to be the center of the Bible, but it's not. You can just do a, you know, nowadays with digital, you can just do a search, how many chapters, how many verses, and all that. But... Um, it's kind of interesting because there's 594 chapters before Psalm 118. There's 594 chapters after Psalm 118. And if you add 594 to 594, you get 1188. Kind of interesting, 118.8. So it may not be the center of the Bible, but this should be the central part of our thoughts in our lives. Better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. And I'll tell you what, it's easy to trust in the Lord when you know who he is. Our God, he's infinite, self-existing, no beginning, no end. He's immutable. He doesn't change. He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere, close to everything, close to everyone. He's self-sufficient. He doesn't have any needs. He's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He's wise. He, he's full of perfect, unchanging wisdom. He's all-faithful. He's infinitely, unchangeably true. He's good. He's kind and full of goodwill. 
Our God is just. He's infinitely, unchangeably right and perfect in all that he does. He's all merciful. He's infinitely inclined to spare the guilty. He's all loving. Infinitely, unchangingly loves us. He's all holy. He's perfect. He's all glorious. He's infinitely beautiful and great. You know, the older that we get, the longer that we walk with the Lord, the more that we realize in our life that we need to put our trust in him, not man, because he is faithful. A quote from our daily bread from April 8th, 1996 says, some years ago, I read an account that went something like this. A group of scientists and botanists were exploring remote regions of the Alps in search of new species of flowers. One day they noticed through binoculars a flower of such rarity and beauty that its value to science was incalculable. But it lay deep in the ravine with cliffs on both sides. To get the flower, someone had to be lowered over the cliff on a rope. A curious young boy was watching nearby and the scientists told him they would pay him well if he would agree to be lowered over the cliff to retrieve the flower below. The boy took one long look down the steep, dizzy depths and said, I'll be back in a minute. And a short time later, he returned, followed by a gray-haired man. Approaching the botanist, the boy said, I'll go over that cliff and get that flower for you if this man holds the rope. He's my dad. That boy trusted his dad. And as we know our Heavenly Father, his attributes, who he is, we too need to put our trust in our dad, our heavenly father. Right? Because we know he holds the rope and it's firm. Well, as the Lord was putting this message on my heart for tonight, I had to ask my, myself this question. Do I fully believe this? I know that it's better to trust in the Lord than to put my trust in man. But do I fully believe it? Do I trust him holding the rope? Do I seek refuge in him? And leading up to this election, I had a bit of anxiety. Probably didn't trust fully in the Lord. My responsibility, our responsibility as a whole basically was just to pray, to vote, and to pray. That's it. Pretty simple. Yeah. But sometimes it's hard. But we have to, tr we have to trust God fully for the outcome. It's, it's on him. Verse 8, it's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. And verse 9 says, it's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. That pertains to us today, right? It does. So we're not to have confidence in man or those who govern or rule over us, but we need to trust in the Lord and we need to pray for them, right? In the New Living Translation, those two verses say, it's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in people. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. The Lord is better, is a better refuge or source, source of security than any man could ever be. In the book of Jeremiah, the Lord agrees with the psalmist. And he says, it's better to trust in the Lord than man. Psalm, or, uh, Jeremiah 17, 5 and 6. What happens to a person who trusts in man? It says, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes his uh, makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. 
For he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land which is not inhabited. It's not a sin to trust people, but it's a sin to trust in people. To devote our deepest faith in another person and to get our hope from that person, that's sin. To give that person the place in our hearts that rightfully belongs to God is sin. And in verse 5, it says that the man is cursed for trusting in man, and in so doing, that his heart has departed from the Lord. Beware if we make flesh our strength. Our heart will depart from the Lord. We have a choice, right? We can either trust in man or we can trust in God. We can't have it both ways. If we tor turn towards something other than the Lord, then we're turning our back away from God. Then in verse 6, Jeremiah pictured a weak, dry shrub in the desert about to die from drought. And this picture is of one who trusts in man instead of the Lord. They're dry and unstable. There aren't a lot of desert shrubs that produce rich fruit. It says they're about to die. And then in verses 7 and 8 in Jeremiah 17, it says, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose hope is in the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river, and will not fear when heat comes. But its leaf will be green, and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. That's a huge contrast from verses 5 and 6. Verse 7 tells us again, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose hope is in the Lord. In verse 5, we read that cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength. Do you want flesh to be your strength or your hope to be in the Lord? What does verse 8 say that his life will look like? It says that he shall be like a tree planted by the waters. And verse 6 says that the man who trusts in man will be like a shrub in the desert. Would you rather be like a tree planted by the waters or like a shrub planted in the desert? Let's turn back to Psalm 118.9. says, it's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. And we have to remember this is attributed most likely by King David. And if that's the case, he's saying that it's better to trust in the Lord, take refuge in the Lord, than to even trust in him being the king. He's encouraging them to trust in the Lord. It's a good, good verse to remember when our preferred political candidate loses. And it's even more of a warning when our preferred political candidate wins. It's better to trust in the Lord. Turn to Psalm 37, 23 with me if you would. Thirty-seven twenty-three it says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. That word good there is in italics. Does anybody know why it's in italics? It's not in the original text. And uh, we all know that the Bible says in Psalm 14.3 that there's none good, no, not one, right? So I looked it up in a commentary, and Clark's commentary says there's nothing for good in the text. So that, the word that, that was um, there, the original word, is geber, the original Hebrew word, geber. And it properly signifies a strong man a conqueror or, or hero. And it appears to be used here to show that even the most powerful must be supported by the Lord. 
Otherwise, their strength and courage will be of little avail. So David says here, the steps of a man or a strong man are ordered by the Lord, implying someone that wants to be instructed by the Lord. In other words, the person has committed his way to God, no matter how strong they may be, will still have his steps made sure by God. He who trusts in the Lord will be supported by the Lord. He will guard them and make sure that their steps are solid. That's pretty encouraging to me. Knowing that everything, even our steps, are important to God. No matter how small those steps are, he loves us so much and he guides us and guides our steps. And the verse says that he delights in doing so. That's an amazing benefit, knowing that he delights in us, even the small things. How's your footing? Do you think you might fall? Verse 24 says, Though he fell, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. It doesn't say if he falls. The verse says, though he fall, meaning when he falls or stumbles. It's, it's going to happen. We're going to fall, but we won't fall to ruin or fall away. And the second part of the verse says that the Lord upholds him with his hand. In other words, those who put their trust in him, not because of being good or because of their own strength, but because of the Lord, they won't be utterly cast down. We may stumble and we may fall, but we won't fall to our destruction. We won't be utterly cast down or destroyed because the Lord upholds us. And then here in verse 25 it says, I have been young and now I'm old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. David's saying here that throughout his life, from when he was young until the time he wrote this psalm, being a bit older, he's seen God's faithfulness to both him and his descendants. And as I was reading this verse, we have to remember that this is David's experience. He's sharing God's faithfulness with us. But we have to be careful with presenting this verse as an absolute principle. And um, I looked at uh, David Guzik's commentary on this, and there were a couple of pastors that had a different take on this. So Adam Clark's had uh, the same experience and observation as David. He said, I believe this to be literally true in all cases. I'm now gray-headed myself. I've traveled in different countries, have had many opportunities of seeing and conversing with religious people in all situations in life. And I have not, to my knowledge, seen one instance to the contrary. I have seen no righteous man forsaken, nor any children of the righteous begging their bread. God puts this honor upon all that fear him, and thus careful is he of them and of their posterity. And then Charles Spurgeon, he, uh, he didn't have the same experience and observation. He said, it's been my unhappy lot within these very walls, speaking of the church, I have, I have to minister relief to the unworthy and reprobate sons of Christian ministers about whose piety I could entertain no doubt and some of who are now in heaven. These good men's children have walked contrary to God, so God has walked contrary to them. I have often hoped that the poverty I saw might be the means of bringing them to seek the God of their fathers. He went on to say, this does not cast doubt upon the observation of David. And then says, ultimately, God's calling each of us individually to trust in him. And so Spurgeon, 
He shared that he ministered relief to some of, the, some of his pastor friends, sons that were walking contrary to God. His hope was that their poverty would be a means of them trusting the Lord. So that, that verse there, that was David's experience. He was sharing from his heart about God's faithfulness. But as I said, we can't take that as absolute principle. He was just sharing about God's faithfulness there. And, um, and he, he did that throughout the Psalms. And we know David's heart because David trusted the Lord. He was called a, God, a man after God's own heart. Did he stumble? Yeah, we all know he stumbled. But God, right? David was repentant. He had a deep desire to do everything that God wanted him to do. He trusted in the Lord. And I'd like to um, meditate on some scripture that encourages us to trust in the Lord and to walk in his ways. I think we all need some encouragement tonight especially if you're feeling anxious or fearful about something. Psalms 1, verses 1 to 3. Psalms 1, 1 to 3. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall, shall prosper. If we're trusting in the Lord, we're not walking in the counsel of the ungodly. The Bible tells us that in a multitude of counsel, there's safety. Proverbs 24, 6. But the Bible also tells us that bad company corrupts good character. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord and walks in the counsel of the godly. Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. Proverbs 34, 22. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. And just as David here wrote verse 22 in this psalm, Paul wrote in Romans 8, 1, There is therefore no condemnation, to those who are in Christ Jesus. Those who have put their trust in the Lord won't be condemned. Souls are already redeemed. Pastor James Brown from Evangeline Baptist Church shared a great story. Some years ago when I was fly, uh, learning to fly, my instructor told me to put the plane into a steep extended dive. I was totally unprepared for what was going to happen. Side note, my dad and I, we got convinced one time to be a dead weight in the back of an uh, airplane when my uncle was learning how to fly, and he had to practice stalls, and we had no idea what it was. <laughs> so this is a stall. After a brief time, the engine stalled, and the plane began to plunge out of control. It soon became came evident that the instructor was not going to help me at all. After a few seconds, which seemed like an eternity, my mind began to function again. I quickly corrected the situation. Immediately, I turned to the instructor and began to vent my fearful frustrations on him. He very calmly said to me, there's no position you can get this airplane into that I can't get you out of. If you want to learn to fly, go up there and do it again. At that moment, God seemed to be saying to me, remember this, as you serve me, there's no situation you can't get yourself into that I cannot get you out of. 
If you trust me, you will be all right. That lesson has been proven true in my ministry many times over the years. Isn't that a cool story? Trust in the Lord. There's no situation that you can get yourself into that God can't get you out of. If you trust in the Lord, you will be blessed. You will be saved, uh, safe and you won't be condemned. Psalms 125.1 says, Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. The first part of the verse, those who trust in the Lord, precedes a promise. You'll be like Mount Zion, which can't be moved. You can't move that mountain. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, a favorite of many. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understandings. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Well, here's a few practical steps that we can take to trust in the Lord. First of all, read his word. We need to know who we're trusting, right? And in order to trust the Lord, we need to know him intimately. Remember the little boy that was lowered down the cliff with a rope? He didn't know the strangers that had offered to pay him to be lowered down to retrieve the rare flower. But he knew his dad intimately. He knew that his dad would make sure the rope was secure. He trusted his dad because he knew him. We also need to know God's character. Our Lord is infinite, immutable, omniscient, omnipresent, self-sufficient, omnipotent, wise, faithful, good, just, all merciful, all gracious, all loving, all holy, all glorious, and the list goes on. His character is displayed throughout the entire Bible. The way that we know God intimately and know his character is by reading his word. Secondly, pray. Take time to talk to God as we have direct access to him. Prayer is the primary way for us to communicate our emotions and desires with God and to fellowship with him. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Paul says, worry about nothing and pray about everything. It says in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, to pray without ceasing. God wants to talk to us about everything. Third, fellowship with other believers. The Christian life isn't meant to be in isolation, but it's meant to fellowship with other believers. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 say, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some. Be exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. Being accountable to one another, praying for one another, and encouraging each other's growth can deepen our trust in the Lord, can't it? So read, pray, fellowship with other believers, and remember God's faithfulness. As we take time to remember God's faithfulness in the past, it helps us trust that he'll remain faithful in the future. As you read the Psalms, you learn that David battled fear and worry, right? David often remembered God's past faithfulness. And he used it to build his faith and to trust in the Lord. And a good example of this is found in Psalms chapter 3. 
Please turn there with me if you would. Psalms 3. Psalms chapter 3. Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him in God, Selah. And Selah means meditate on that. Meditate on what was just said. David shared here how there were many enemies that surrounded him. And they taunted him, saying that he had no hope of being delivered by God. And then verse 3, it says, But you, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory, and the one who lifts up my head. You guys remember that song? I think Pastor Jeff knows it. He might even be willing to sing it at the end. I don't know. We'll see. Thou, O Lord, are a shield about me. You're my glory and the lifter of my head. Even though many have come against me, you, God, are my shield, the source of all my protection. And David was confident that God would lift up his head and restore him in dignity and position. And then verses four and five, I cried to the Lord with my voice and he heard me from his holy hill, Selah. I lay down and slept. I awoke for the Lord sustained me. God has, had sustained David here through the night in the midst of his enemies. And when David knew, with that, David knew that he would have complete deliverance. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you have struck all my enemies on the cheekbone. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people. David remembered God's past faithfulness as he delivered him from his enemies. Remembering God's faithfulness changed David's attitude from fear to confidence. And he trusted God would remain faithful in the future. And I know that that's with us. That happens with us, right? When we see God's faithfulness in the past, that encourages us in the situation that we're going through right now and for the future. It comforts us. There's a lot more practical steps, but read, read the Bible. Pray. Fellowship with other believers. And remember God's faithfulness. Should we put our confidence in man? Nope. Should we put our confidence in princes? Nope. Presidents? Nope. Well, those verses again, Psalm 118, says, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. In closing, I'd like to read a promise from Psalm 3312. It says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. We want to be a blessed nation, right? And then a bit later in verses 20 and 22 of Psalm 33, it says, well, prayer is connected to that promise says, our soul waits for the Lord. He's our help and our shield. For our heart shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. Let your mercy, O Lord, be upon us just as we hope in you. And if our country is to experience the blessing of God and help from him, we need our country to turn back to God and to put their trust in him, right? And what Jeff said up there on the screen, just love Jesus 
and love your neighbor more than you love yourself, right? So my encouragement to each one of us is to trust in the Lord. It, it might be easy sometimes to say, all right, things have changed. Things are on track. Our government's going to just be getting all this stuff sorted out, whatever the case may be. But ultimately, that we're putting our trust in princes. We're putting our trust in man. We need to put our trust in the Lord. We need to recognize his faithfulness to us and uh, rejoice in that. So let's go ahead and bow before the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this, you this evening, Lord. And Lord, I just want to pray for our country. As I mentioned before, there's a lot of people that I know that we're excited. And I know that there's a lot of people that aren't excited in our country. And ultimately, Father, our desire is for each one of us to trust in you, Lord. Our desire is to share the love of Jesus with others so that others, too, trust in you. We know that you hold the rope. You're faithful. If we fall down, you're there to pick us up. We know these things. We need to believe them in our hearts and we need to act on those, Lord. So my prayer is for each one of us in this room that we end out this year well, Lord. Lord, that you would minister to our hearts, that you would fill us with joy as we trust in you, Lord. Lord, I do pray for the administration that's in the White House right now, Father, that's going to be exiting in the next couple months, Lord. I lift them up, Lord. I ask, Lord, that they would know you and trust in you, Father. I lift up the new administration that's going to be transitioning in the, over the next couple months. And I, too, pray for each one of them to know you and trust you, Lord. That we would, that this nation would be a nation under God. Lord, that we would love people, that we would share the love of Jesus with others. So minister to our hearts tonight, Lord. Allow us to come alongside of others that are going through it, Lord, and share with them about your goodness and your grace and how you're there to pick them up if they fall, how you're a compassionate God, how you're all loving. Lord, just minister to us to minister to others, Father. Allow us to trust you more, Father. Lord, be with Pastor Bert and the others, Lord. And uh, we thank you once again for your loving kindness. Be with us the rest of this evening. In Jesus' name.